Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. The topic today is survey data. And my guest is Beth Umland, who is a partner and leads research for us. Hey, Beth, thanks for joining me today. Hey, Tracy, good to be here. So Beth, let's talk about the 2021 survey. And I think we should first focus on cost. So the cost increase, 6.3%, that was quite a spike we're seeing. Yes, um, especially you know when you think that for like the past 10 years, we've been seeing health benefit cost per employee grow by about you know 3% a year. It's been a pretty uh, steady plateau. So that 6.3% increase in 2021 really was a change in the direction of the trend and uh, certainly an eye opener. Um, on the one hand, you could kind of expect that would happen because uh, in 2020, you know, a lot of folks avoided care. So it's um, maybe to be expected that we'd see an increase the following year as people started getting back to getting their elective care. But the size of the increase was still a bit startling. And even though um, employers project that the cost will rise about 4.4% next year, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that they made that prediction back in the summer. Um, and I think maybe folks weren't thinking that inflation was gonna hang around as long as it has. So I think there's some you know, cause for concern that um, rather than seeing the trend kind of normalize back down to that 3% increase, we're gonna, go in, we're gonna be entering a period of some cost acceleration. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, we actually have spent quite a bit of time talking about that prediction by employers of 4.4%. Um, and clearly they're still focused on cost because if we look at the top you know, three or four strategies that employers said that they're focused on for the next few years, managing prescription drug costs is one of them, especially specialty drugs. And that's something you know, that's been um, in a, as a top strategy for several years now, as well as managing high cost claimants. And both of those will continue to have an impact on cost, as well as just external market factors like new drugs coming on the market, especially high cost drugs. Um, pressures that the healthcare delivery system is seeing because of competition for talent. You know, there's just a lot of things that could be impacting costs. So um, yeah, I think we all need to be really careful about um, the prediction for, for future increases. Um, you know, in my opinion, there were three big stories coming out of the survey this year. The first one I have to say is my favorite because it is that we saw a decrease in deductibles. And in our long history with the survey, we have never said that before. So, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on that? And, and um, um, did you expect to see that? No, never expected to see a decrease. I, I will say I was prepared um, because we have seen deductible amounts, the average deductible amount kind of flattening over the past couple of years. Um, it's coming off of 10 years of some pretty significant growth. I mean, employers have been using, you know, cost shifting as a way to manage their um, health benefit cost growth, particularly in the, you know, back when they were still worrying about the Cadillac tax and, and needing to bring the, the plan costs down so that they wouldn't get hit with an excise tax. So the easiest way to do that was through cost shifting. But I think over time, employers started to feel like they'd gone about as far as they could go, started worrying about affordability, especially for their low wage workers. And so we did see those increases in the deductible starting to flatten, but uh, an actual decrease, no, that is a first in, in my experience. So are you willing to go so far as to make a prediction that the deductibles will continue to decrease? Well, I would like to make that prediction, but I'm not going to because you have to remember we are also, you know, entering a period of higher cost growth, mm -hmm. and so uh, tough to say, you know, what employers will um, need to do in order to manage that higher cost growth. But I think the the mood is definitely um, uh, away from cost shifting and towards finding other means of of controlling costs that um, don't shift more cost to the employees. Okay. So the second big story, at least in my opinion, from the survey is a growing commitment to giving employees a choice of plans or put differently, a movement away from high deductible, um, full replacement plans. And, you know, 
it wasn't that long ago that full replacement high deductible plans were kind of a strategy. And so it looks like we're seeing that change. Yeah, I think, you know, high deductible plans, the, the full replacement strategy really did come into play as part of that move towards we really need to manage cost because, you know, there's the threat of the excise tax. Um, but over the past few years, um, that's really, we've seen employers really backing away from that. And, and it's really among the largest employers. They were the first to um, pick up on the full replacement strategy. I think it sort of peaked at around 22% of jumbo employers, and that's employers with 20,000 or more employees, uh, moving to a full replacement strategy. And over the past three years, that's fallen down to just like 13%. So not that um, you know, that's a movement away from HSA plans. Um, in fact, HSA enrollment continued to grow. We're up to 40% of uh, all covered employees now in an HSA eligible plan. Um, but I think employers are aware that those plans don't, you know, they don't, they they work differently for different employees, for low wage earners or folks with you know, real health issues, a high deductible plan is not going to be the best fit for other employees. It's really a smart move. So on the one hand, we're seeing you know, a movement away from full replacement, but we're not seeing a move away from um, HSAs in general. So I had a call a week or so ago with colleagues out in San Francisco and shout out to Parsh Bashaw, who uh, manages a couple of surveys that we do out there for the high tech industry. And I was talking to him because even my clients that aren't high tech employers, they need that talent for certain functions within their organization. So it seems like everybody wants to know, you know, what's going on with high tech, because that's been a, a really um, tough, you know, type of talent to find. And one of the things that he said to me is that he's starting to see employers add in choices but they're PPO or HMO type choices. And so I thought that that was really interesting. And it kind of makes me wonder if we will see an increase in the average number of plans offered by employers. It'll probably take a while for that to show up, but I'm going to go out on, an, on the ledge and make a prediction that we will see an increase in the average number of plans offered next year in the survey data. So we'll see if that comes true or not, but I do think that that is something interesting for um, our, our audience to think about in terms of what they're offering their employees as it relates to choice. So I wanna change gears a little bit um, as we talk about the third big story from the survey. It, in my opinion, it focuses around resiliency. You know, how do we better support people um, having been in a pandemic for two years now? There's a war for talent. Attraction and retention is one of the top issues for all employers that I talk to. And so one of the things that I think is interesting around resiliency is that we've seen employers focus more on um, specific segments of their employee population where there are benefit gaps. And certainly the pandemic has um, really put into focus people with um, health inequities, people that don't have access to care or benefits that they need. And so what did, what did we find in the survey? Yes, well, this, was the, this was the first year we asked a question specifically about um, you know, what are employers doing to close benefit gaps for certain employee groups? Um, you know, Black employees, uh, LGBTQ, and, uh, you know, people with disabilities. And, you know, it's, it's we're in the early days yet, but, um, you know, 25% of large employers, anyway, 5,000 or more employees, say they have taken steps specifically to close benefit gaps for Black employees. And we've got kind of a, a laundry list of, of the actions that employers are taking. And just to, to call out the most common is to kind of update provider directories so that you can find a provider that you feel an affinity with. Um, but we're also seeing things like, you know, uh, enhancing maternal benefits for black women specifically, um, since we know that there have been, you know, poor outcomes um, for uh, black mothers. Um, with the LGBTQ community, employers are really focusing on more inclusive family benefits, and and with for people with disabilities, we're seeing them, you know, employers making sure that they have 
uh, you know, benefits to support employees who have hearing or vision loss as well as um, other disabilities. So yeah, early days, but I think the awareness is there and, and employers are starting to move on, on these, on closing these benefit gaps. Well, and related to that, we saw a big increase in the offering of, you know, what a category that we're calling family friendly benefits, which is every definition of family that you can imagine, um, not just traditional, but non-traditional definitions of family. And these benefits are really becoming a differentiator for employers and, and maybe soon to just become expected from everyone. But gosh, increases all over these categories. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, this is everybody's favorite slide this year because it, it really tells a good story that employers are, you know, sort of well aware that employees have really been struggling the past few years, um, you know, trying to really help with that family um, work balance. I think that's what these benefits are all about. And, you know, it's a very long list and there was growth in just about every single one of these uh, uh, well-being resources and, and, and benefits. So um, a lot of good news on that slide. And I think, um, you know, employers are moving in the right direction there. Yeah, so I thought we would close out our discussion really focusing in on attraction and retention. And um, I have to bring this up because it's probably my favorite piece of research and analysis that you've done lately. And um, again, because it just really brings into focus attraction and retention and what employers can do. And I like to call um, this slide more benefits, more better. But will you just tell everybody about the analysis that you did? Sure. So this data is comes from our health on demand survey, which was actually a global survey of workers, not employers. We usually do employer research, but with this survey, we kind of got the employee voice. And we had 2000 uh, US workers in the survey. And what we did was we asked them, we gave them a laundry list of 16 different health and well-being benefits and resources and just asked them, you know, which ones does your employer provide? And then we broke them into groups based on how many of those benefits they received, not what the benefits were, but just the number. And then compared um, employees who receive five or more of these benefits uh, to those who receive uh, 10 or more. So I'm sorry, 10 or more versus five or fewer. And what we found was um, that the group that received 10 or more benefits um, answered a number of important questions very differently than the group that received fewer benefits. Um, first of all, uh, they said they were more they were more likely to say they could afford the health care that they needed. Um, they were more likely to say they were engaged at work. They were more likely to say they believed their employer cared about their health and well-being. And then to your point, Tracy, they were significantly more likely to say that benefits were a reason for them to stay at their jobs. So I think there definitely is uh, an implication there around attraction and retention. Just the more different benefits that you offer, the more likely it is that you're offering something that has you know, strong value for you know, every individual employee. You know, it, that just made me think about um, situations where employees don't always know all of the benefits that they have access mm -hmm. to. They may only know about the ones that they've personally used. And so this could also be a call to action to relook at your communications, how you communicate your benefits, because there could be a lot of extra value that you could be delivering to people. They just don't know mm -hmm. that the benefits benefits are there. So um, that's kind of an interesting takeaway from, from that data. But I do think that um, focusing overall on the needs of your employees and how you could meet those needs with your benefits combined with the overall objectives of your organization and how can you match those things up so that what you're doing for your employees indeed supports the objectives of your organization is just a real win-win. So um, thank you so much for coming today to talk about the survey data and um, we'll definitely continue this dialogue and, and do this again real soon. Thanks, Tracy. Great talking with you.